You know, about two days ago, I was about to make a completely different kind of video on this game. I was gonna call it something along the lines of Rain Code is abhorrent or Rain Code is a complete and utter disaster. But now, after getting through the final chapter of the game, I have to say that these statements still apply, but only to about the first 90% of the game. The final chapter made up for how terrible the first five chapters of the game were. I have no problem saying that. And uh, I'll be elaborating here in a second. Uh, and I actually want to tackle everything I think is wrong with this game chapter to chapter. So this is your spoiler warning. By the way, if you're still watching this video, I'm going to assume that you've already played and finished this game. As you can probably tell from the Monokuma up there, as well as these two douchebags on my wall, I'm a huge fan of Kodaka's games. That Danganronpa 2 was my favorite visual novel of all time for a good while until I discovered the AI Samian files that is. So believe me when I say I would have loved to come on here and sing this game's praises for the next 20 minutes, but I just, I just can't do that. Not when the writing is this crappy. And listen, if you enjoyed Rain Code, well, well, first off, good for you. I'm glad someone got some value for their money at least. Second, I'm extremely jealous you're able to enjoy this piece of shit game. And third, this doesn't mean this video isn't for you. I would instead like it if fans of this game stuck around to hear out all the criticisms I have towards the game. Uh, I like having people with differing opinions to my own in my own comment sections. It's where all the best video game discussions take place. You know, kind of like this guy. Don't listen to the positive comments, bro. Be like this guy. Fire emoji, fire emoji, fire emoji. And for these same people, I'll promise I'll go a bit easier on this game from now on, because I imagine it's not that fun listening to someone badmouth something you really like. Hell, I'll even start with a couple of positive things I have to say about it. For one, this game is clearly far more ambitious than any other game Kodaka has worked on thus far. The man spent, what, six years working on this game? And it shows. We get a whole ass city to explore this time, and NPCs have actual models models and aren't just blue and pink silhouettes or cardboard cutouts for that matter. And the visuals are beautiful. Uh, the budget is clearly there this time. The game's premise is also immediately very captivating. A group of detectives, each having access to their own forte, their own supernatural power to help with investigations, on a mission to investigate an uncharted city that's been cut off from the rest of the world and where crime is a daily occurrence. The game's premise alone gives the game so much potential and differentiates it from the Danganronpa series. They could do so many crazy and wacky murder cases here cases that can only be solved in a world where superpowers exist. But as soon as the first case, that possibility is immediately shattered. And I'm not even talking about the fact that all five of the detectives you meet at the very start all bite the dust in the very first chapter, which I hate by the way. I've noticed with this twist as well as the first case in Danganronpa V3 that Kodaka seems to prefer pure shock value over entertainment. With this twist, we just wasted five potentially great characters, one of which has one of the best character designs I've ever seen out of her way. She's even voiced by Lauren Landa. C come on, couldn't she have survived at least? But let's start my rant here at Chapter Zero, Massacre on the Amaterasu Express. Again, I'm going to assume that you've already played this game and already know the details of each case, so I won't bother explaining each murder scheme in detail. Honestly, the case itself is fantastic. It's a brilliant scheme that Zilch cooked up, or at least the guy who is pretending to be Zilch. It's a mystery that I solved fairly quickly after just one look at the train tracks, but just because it's easily solved doesn't mean it isn't a clever plan. And plus, for a first case, it's fairly complicated, especially since 11037 was a thing that happened. But unfortunately, everything starts going to shit as soon as the game introduces its unique gameplay mechanic, which is a counterpart to class trials, the mystery labyrinth. My god, are these things infuriating. Now, considering how simple first cases usually are in Danganronpa games, it's usually usually compensated by having a trial that's on the shorter end of the spectrum. Not in this game, no. This part goes on for like two goddamn hours. Why? Because our two main characters are dumber than bricks, that's why. Um, Master, I don't really get it. What do you mean the first car was cut off? What do you mean what do I mean the first car was cut off, bitch? Look at this map. Look at this. I saw you puke this out earlier. You look at this and you tell me what the fuck I mean. Can you imagine how obnoxious this is? So having solved the mystery like ages ago and then watching these two scurry around for two hours trying to figure things out. That's another thing. Two characters? For two hours? Imagine having two 
characters debating in a class trial for, for two hours. And by the way, out of all the possible combinations of characters we could have had as a partner in this game, why did the developers settle on the Hiyoko plus Junko hybrid? That's quite literally the worst thing they could have come up with. There is a correct way to make an obnoxious character who's also likable, by the way, and that's to make them funny at least. I mean, just look at Miyu. But no, Shinigami is boring and obnoxious. And she's quite possibly the game's biggest fault. If she were to disappear, I would like this game so much more. I would not have minded her as much if Yuma, our protagonist, was the type to stand up to her shenanigans. But no, this boy's even surpassed Makoto Naegi on the beta male scale. Yes, the beta male scale. I, I just came up with that. Now, honestly, while I did figure out the entire murder plan, I wasn't quite sure who the culprit was. Really, there were only two possible options, Zilch or Aphex. But since there was no evidence for Zilch faking his own death yet, my primary suspect was Aphex. As in, the scenario plays out exactly the same way, but instead of Zilch placing his glasses on Aphex's corpse, Aphex places his necklace on Zilch's corpse instead to confuse us. And really, as far as we know, there was no way for Yuma to figure out which had actually occurred. Uh, not until we find the pillow that Zilch used to stab a knife into just to fake his own death. But here's what doesn't make sense. The game wanted us to accuse Zilch before that evidence came to light. The only reason Yuma went back to the crime scene to find the pillow as evidence was after concluding that Zilch did it. So this is a pretty major oversight on the developer's part. Also, please let me know if I'm wrong here in regards to Aphex also potentially being the culprit. Uh, I could very well be missing something something obvious, uh, but I don't think I am. Regardless, the first mystery labyrinth of the game was mind-numbing to get through. And it doesn't help that the banter between Yuma and Shinigami sucks complete ass. I actually started skipping voice dialogue. I, I never do that. But Shinigami never has anything of value to say, so why bother listening? I'm used to having to read some dumbass dialogue in between the serious shit and Danganronpa, but this is a whole nother level of dog shit. So yeah, this first case was not a great first impression for the rest of the game. Uh, the only positive really is that I think the case summary music was heavenly as always. It's the only song in the game that really stuck with me. Uh, so overall, I give this chapter like a 4 out of 10. We could do a lot better than this. Next up, we move to the prologue, and this is where we get to meet our actual cast who haven't been burned to a bloody crisp. And I have to say that I'm very indifferent to almost every single character in this game. The only one I actually really like is Hubuki, but I'll get to her later in chapter 3 when she's actually relevant. Next is chapter 1, the nail man killings. I again have to say that the case itself, like the first one, I really enjoy. We're dealing with multiple schemes this time each involving a locked room mystery and even a copycat killer all in a single chapter. One thing I can appreciate about this game is how it doesn't dilly-dally before getting to the actual case. We don't have to wait forever before a murder actually happens. Now, I managed to figure out most of the locked room mysteries by myself, but I couldn't quite pinpoint who the culprit was. In my eyes, it was between the priest and the nun, who don't have actual names, by the way. That's another thing. Figuring out that one of these people committed murder is not as impactful as it should be because we literally just met them. We haven't spent hours with them like say our classmates in Danganronpa and they're not even important enough to have names and in later cases all possible suspects don't have last names. But now we make our way to our second mystery labyrinth and what do you know we actually have a guest character joining us this time. I mean three characters debating in a class trial isn't much but it's better than two at least so I'll take it. Oh what's that? Guest characters always convenient lose all their memories of the case so now we get three dumb characters instead of two well fuck me you try to give this game a chance and then it just shoots itself in the foot let's fast forward a bit so yuma decides that the culprit has to be the priest because the nun had a broken hand and thus could not have created one of the locked room mysteries but again here's what doesn't make sense we have no proof that the nun did not injure her hand after committing the crime. Hell, we're not even sure she's not just pretending to be injured. As detectives, weren't we supposed to question everything? Something this game hammers to us over and over again? And uh, actually, on second thought, let's zoom out a bit. Forget these four suspects. Accusing someone without concrete evidence makes sense in Danganronpa because there are only a select number of people trapped inside. Here though, we're in a whole ass city. We can't go around accusing people randomly. We can't accuse the 
priest of being the culprit just because he's the only one who had access to the incinerator. What exactly is stopping anyone in this city from going inside the church, burning the evidence, then leaving? So the case up until now is a complete mess. But uh, the copycat killing was a nice surprise, I'll admit. And the evidence we used to prove that uh, the worshipper was in fact the copycat killer, the fact that uh, Halar's post-cognition showed that he wasn't in fact the first culprit, the first witness, sorry. Uh, th that was awesome. That was the best thing this game has done so far. And this is partly what I wanted from this game. I wanted our detective forte is to directly affect the case's outcome. So yeah, overall, I give this chapter a 5 out of 10, a slight step up from our previous case. Up next is chapter 2, A Silent Curtain Call. And this is the chapter where Shinigami cements herself as being one of the worst characters ever concocted in the history of fiction. The very second we meet Kurumi, who's a fine character I would say, I'm not infatuated with her or anything, but she's alright I guess. Shinigami just goes apeshit on us. She doesn't once shut up about Kurumi's supposedly flat chest, which she must be blind to believe, by the way, and Yuma's non-existent perversions. Every single line of dialogue, I shit you not. I thought this kind of humor died ages ago, but not in Kodaka's mind, I guess. Anyway, so the murder happens, a great cutscene, by the way, and we proceed to use Desuhiko's disguise ability to gather information. Excellent use of a character's forte, and this might actually be my favorite investigation segment in the game. Uh, too bad Shinigami's here to fucking ruin it. I got plenty of good sniffs in. The more he talks, the less likable he gets. <laughs> You're the last person to say that, Shinigami. Making her self-aware was the least that you could do to make her somewhat tolerable. Now, I wasn't quite sure how this case played out exactly. All three suspects were incredibly suspicious, but at the time, I thought it couldn't be all three of them, right? That's less interesting than having one super genius mastermind that pulled the wool over all of our eyes, right? So my main suspect was Kurene, because she could have used the eyedropper in her locker, which you I decided to ignore, by the way, adding to my frustration, uh, to drop the poison into Karen's glass. Now, this wasn't right, but I stuck with that theory for a while before realizing that they all did indeed have a hand in it. And it was actually Yoshiko who uh, swapped out Karen's glass with the poisoned one. Now, I want to use this plot point to show you just how bullshit these mystery labyrinths could get. This question asks, when was the glass set on stage? And keep in mind that players at this point would already know that there were two wine glasses swapped out with each other. So which of these two glasses is, is this question asking about exactly? The normal one or the poisoned one? I assumed the poisoned one, well, because why would we bother talking about the other unpoisoned glass this far into the case? But no, they were actually asking about the original glass that was swapped out. Okay, fine. My bad, I guess. But immediately after, this is what they ask. When was the poison placed in the glass? Now asking about the other poison glass. It's like, dude, make up your mind. These questions are incredibly misleading and have no place in a detective game. And here's another one for you. When we're trying to prove that Kurene couldn't have eye dropped the poison in, the game gives us the option to refute one of the following statements. Kurene used an eyedropper to add the poison or she dripped the poison right in. Only one of these statements is refutable. How does that make any sense? They literally mean the same thing. At this point in the game, I've lost all hope in the these reasoning battles being fun or interesting in any way. And after one last ironic remark from Shinigami, she executes the three culprits as I'm on my phone browsing Reddit waiting for her to finish because I've already seen this exact same cutscene two times at this point. That closes the curtain on chapter 2. 5 out of 10. This one just made me very exhausted. Next up is chapter 3 no longer a detective. Well, good news is, uh, my expectations for this game were pretty low at this point, so there wasn't much the game could do to disappoint me any further. Except for literally the worst QTE sections I have ever experienced in my life. What the fuck is this? Why are these so awkward? They make AI Somnium Falls dumb QTE sections look like full-blown cinematic masterpieces. Out of everything you could have taken inspiration from from AI the Somnium Falls, QTE sections we're not the answer. Despite that, Fubuki's presence in this chapter does soften the blow a bit. In a game filled with some of the most detestable characters known to man, Fubuki, she's my lord and savior. Most of my favorite lines of dialogue in this game come from Fubuki's airheadedness. Most notably, this one. I am so naive that the servants call me 
dummy thick behind my back. Uh, not too soon after, uh, during one of the Dom QDE sections, I actually busted out laughing for the first time playing this game uh, at this scene. I genuinely thought the button prompt was meant to help the guy up, but no, Fubuki just went and boop. So thank you, Fubuki, for breathing life back into my broken soul. As for the case itself, who cares at this point? I think even the fandom agrees that this case in particular sucks complete ass. We pretty much figure out the entire thing just by talking to this old man. Icardi was the most obvious culprit thus far. It's actually insane how there was literally zero effort to throw us off the trail. Literally everything in this case involves water and Icardi is the only swimmer we know. The old man had an airtight alibi and the midget can't swim. And we already know the suspect is male, so so that knocks Iruka off the list. But even when it's this obvious, Yuma can't help but start making baseless accusations during the labyrinth that always somehow end up being true. In every single case thus far, he's always been making assumptions, just like how it's an assumption to say that the, this entire crime in this chapter was a bank robbery. We have zero evidence to support this theory. I would have given this case like a 3 or a 4 out of 10, but just out of respect for Fubuki, I'm gonna bump it up to a 5 out of 10. Now on to chapter 4, The Imperfect Insider. This case starts out fantastic, most notably because all the master detectives are here and all of them, including their fortes, have something to contribute in some way to the case at large. And this is the first case where I actually had zero clue on how the culprit did this crime, meaning this was the first time I was actually fully invested and intrigued by a case in this game. But there has to be a catch, right? We can't have a chapter that's entertaining the entire way through what are you stupid no let's throw in the worst mystery labyrinth thus far in this chapter just to even things out we got misleading questions but even worse yuma just ignores massive plot holes in his arguments and we're the ones playing as yuma so the game expects us to ignore those holes too after we conclude that the culprit hopped on amapal the toy robot thing we used to get past the lab security system the characters just ignore the fact that the culprit wouldn't be able to avoid the poison gas and they don't acknowledge that fact for like 20 minutes until vivia decides to talk about it the way this script is written is torturous. In these 20 minutes, I'm just thinking, please, somebody bring up the issue of the poison gas. What, what's wrong with you people? Oh, and another thing that's messed up. Once I got Amapal to open the lab's door, I was mashing the button to retract the arm and hurry up inside. But no, the game forces us to sit there and wait until the door is fully open before we get to move again. This was incredibly suspicious and I was right because the culprits used that opening to hop inside and commit the crime. But how would the culprit know that Yuma would just sit there like a dumbass instead of hurrying inside? This is a major oversight. Something that has to be known is that a detective game needs to respect the player's intelligence and it needs to be able to predict what the player is thinking as we're going through the case. Otherwise, it devolves into one of the most frustrating gaming experiences you can have. At this point in the game, I realized that the only way to actually enjoy these mystery labyrinths is to actively not pay attention to the facts of the case, just so it doesn't drive you crazy when Yuma misses the obvious stuff and to have actual surprise here and there. So anyway, uh, Chief Yako was the culprit and uh, he dies. Uh, I think I was supposed to feel some kind of sorrow here, but uh, truth be told, I don't know the guy. We've barely spent any time with him. Oh, and this whole thing of being surrounded by peacekeepers only for someone to jump in and save us at the last second has happened like four times by now. So now it's just lazy and we know it's gonna happen. So any suspense goes out the window. Now, the first half of this case might have been like a seven or an eight out of 10, but overall, just because of how frustrating the writing was, I'd also give this chapter a 5 out of 10. But now, finally, onto this game's one saving grace, chapter 5, and then I was gone. In this chapter, 
everything gets turned on its head and you get plot twist after plot twist and not the cheap kind of plot twist where they only exist for pure shock value no th these are well thought out twists that were planted all the way from the very beginning of the game right off the bat boom zombies this is what's been happening to all the corpses thus far i knew there had to be something regarding how kanai ward uh, disposes of corpses but i just thought they used uh, dr weska's chemicals to dissolve the bodies i never expected this i also never thought zombies would be what i'd remember raincoat for but uh, here we are i guess what's funnier is that the answer has been staring me in the face for the past year and i never thought anything of it not to mention the various nods to japanese mythology like the names yomi amaterasu and kagutsuchi all hinting at the fate of the goddess Izanami in Japanese folklore. Which, I mean, being a fan of the Shin Megami Tensei series helps me appreciate stuff like this a lot more. And after that twist, the second I entered the factory and realized that they were making meat buns, my heart just dropped and I immediately understood what it was alluding to. That was the plot twist that shook me the hardest. Another thing was the pink blood plot twist, which uh, I mean I did remember that Yuma's blood was red at the beginning of the game, uh, but at first I took that to mean that Yuma was the homunculi who escaped, not the entire goddamn city of Kanai Ward. That was insane. So yeah, hats off to the writing in this chapter. This was amazing and I didn't expect this since Danganronpa's final chapters are always known to be the worst things known to man. Even Shinigami dolls down her antics a bit during this chapter and she even becomes a bit self-aware towards the end which, uh, I, I mean, it, I wish it happened like 20 hours ago. So yeah, this chapter was fantastic. I'd give it an 8.5 out of 10. An incredible ending to an otherwise shitty game. In my eyes, this averages the game to be around a 6 out of 10. While this final chapter made me not regret playing this game, I still do regret paying full price for it. This game is not worth $55. Come on now. Maybe $20, maybe. But while this game puts the quality of Kodaka's future games into question, I will try to remain hopeful. 100 line defense academy thing, whatever you call it, it's all on you. Don't let me down. Anyways, that's all I have for now. Uh, kind of a negative video today, I know, but I'm just being honest here. And hey, on the bright side, playing a mediocre game like this, right before playing Metaphor, it's gonna help me appreciate that game so much more. Always look on the bright side. So thank you guys for watching. Please consider subscribing and liking the video if you enjoyed. It really helps me out a lot. And as always, I'll see you in the next one. Peace.